So, Dr. Boston, we had another great program here with you tonight. That was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, we got to see, you guys got to see a lot of new people, but we didn't hit on certain subjects, mm -hmm. though, that I think that more patients need to better recognize, and that would be like therapeutic inertia. Can you explain what this is about? I would love to. Um, this is a term that I stumbled on very recently, and I've kind of fallen in love with it. There's an, there's an issue in MS delivery of care where a patient will need to escalate or change a therapy, but it doesn't happen. And this Why? Is, it, I think there's a multitude of reasons, and therapeutic inertia starts to explain that. So the concept of therapeutic inertia is when there's a need for change, but it doesn't happen. And, and let's think about a couple different uh, players. The patient can contribute to therapeutic inertia. The patient, at times, wants to please the doctor. You know, they, they want to be good. They want to have done a good job. And so I've had patients tell me, I don't want to tell you about something bad that happens because I don't want you to think I'm not doing a good job. And so you have to work with them about that. Uh, sometimes a patient will avoid talking about a problem they're having with MS, an attack, for example, because I've told them, if you have another attack, we have to change your drug, and they don't want to do that. Sometimes the patient participates in therapeutic inertia just because they don't know what to share. They're, they're not aware of the things that they need to talk about. Payers can contribute to therapeutic inertia. So a payer who is uh, looking at a formulary of drugs may have what seems to be an arbitrary, it's called a step edit, where you can't have drug X until you have failed drug YZ in purple. And, and sometimes that can create a delay in getting a patient onto a therapy that they need. But Before you go forward, I just want to ask you a question. Sure. There are a lot of people that don't know what a payer is. What's a payer? Thank you. So when in, in the United States, the way that we deliver health care is an employer purchases insurance from a payer. So that would be like, example, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Okay. Or like Medicare. Okay. And so that's what I mean by payer, thank you. The biggest culprit, in my opinion, is the doctor. I think that we are culpable of creating therapeutic inertia. And there's a multitude of reasons why. Uh, you heard me earlier today talk about what I call sins of our fathers. And, and, I, and I mean this in a, in, in a respectful manner, that guys that train me remember when there weren't drugs. And so going from no drugs to any drug is a revolution, a, a proper revolution. Then we had 15 years where, in hindsight, we had several mild to moderately effective drugs that all things considered were relatively safe. And those doctors became very, very comfortable with those therapies. Now you have uh, the leaders of the field in some cases that have been doing this for 20 years and remember not having therapy. And now there's these newfangled therapies that are coming out. It happens that many of them are, in fact, more effective than the old drugs. It also, I absolutely say, is they're way more complex. And so you're forcing a doctor to consider efficacy, but also safety that he's never thought about before. And that's a deal breaker for some docs, and they, and they don't want to adopt. And so I was trained um, by a generation of men that remembered that. And it led to my practice you know, honestly adopting therapies that in hindsight I feel bad about using. And, and I think that we all need to be cognizant of this concept of therapeutic inertia. And when we see it, we have to call it out. I'll give you an example. A patient says, you know, I, I need my MRI, and you look at it with them, and there's a new spot. Right. And the doc says, well, it's just one new spot. Right. You look great, you're doing great. Well, the data teaches us that one or two new spots will oftentimes predict failure of a therapy five years later. And I don't want to wait five years. And so we have to get the word out that when you see even subclinical disease, you have to act. Right. But going back to the therapeutic inertia, so that for, you know, like I myself just learned about it recently because you brought it up to yeah. my attention. Yeah. And I, I had to get on the Internet and find out what it is. And it's basically what you're saying, though, is that the doctors are just, they feel that, they can't do anything further for a patient, so they're stopping, or that they just only believe in the platform therapies? I think it's deeper than that. You know, you think about the average uh, neurologist in the United States spends 15 minutes with a patient, which I find abominable. Right. During, I can't get a patient comfortably in the room, get their jacket off, bring them a cup of coffee in 15 minutes, let alone ask them how they're doing. So the doctor in 15 minutes is desperately trying to rush through all the things that he has to ask you. He says, hey, how are you doing on your therapy? Good. Oh, that's great. Have any problems? Nope. Wonderful. Next patient. That wasn't a real conversation. And it takes time and it takes effort. And I think sometimes we're not in medicine afforded that. 
except that's unacceptable. We have to make time. We have to put forth effort. Because to allow someone to smolder in developed disease activity in the modern era is unacceptable. And, and so I don't think it's that they just believe in one thing. I, I, I think it's more complex than that. And in my opinion, a doctor like that needs to stop treating multiple sclerosis and needs to let someone else who, who cares and is passionate do it. Okay, great. So going a little bit further though, we're talking about patient care now. Mm -hmm. And what do you feel the clinicians that are taking care of a patient, especially a newly diagnosed patient, what do they do? How, do they, how does a newly diagnosed patient come into the room and how do you react as a clinician, as a neurologist, mm -hmm. how do you educate the family that, hey, you know, we just found these white spots or gray matter or, or black holes or whatever, and, and how do you talk to them about this? That's a very critical issue, um, and it can be done wrong. Uh, it also sets the stage for a therapeutic relationship which will last decades. And so I think that this moment that you're talking about, this time when you're clarifying a diagnosis and you're starting to change what they're going to need to think about, that's a critical time, and that's a very, very privileged time. Um, for starters, if I accept a consultation, I need them to send me their MRIs and all their records before I see them preferentially so I can look at them all. I may spend hours doing that depending on what I need to look at, and that's not time I'm going to spend in the room. That's my homework to get ready to see you. I ask the patient to fill out an 11-page questionnaire, which is daunting, but I need them to do it. Not so that I can have their answers, so that they're thinking about their answers. Because I'm asking them questions about things that happened 20 years ago. I'm needing them to drudge up things that they don't necessarily think about every day. That sets the stage for our meeting, and I take an hour and a half for a new consultative visit. That's a long period of time, and sometimes people challenge me and say that I need to speed up, and I tell them no because I need that time frame. The first thing that we do is I, I tell them, I've read what they wrote, but now I need to hear it from you. Not your, not your wife, I need to hear it from you, and I need you to go back in time to when something weird happened that led to a diagnosis or a question of a diagnosis or something that brought you to see me. And that conversation can take a while, and you have to let the person share, and you have to be a good listener and listen to the details, because the, the majority of the diagnosis for relapsing forms of MS or progressive forms of MS are made by the history. The next thing that I need to do is I need to do my own proper examination. So I need to do a full-blown neuro exam from head to toe. I need to know what your cerebellar function coordination looks like. I need to understand how well you articulate with parts of speech. I gotta, I gotta figure that out because I have to get a sense of do I see things on exam that match your story? And it also gives me great insight into which systems aren't going so hot. Then we need to look at MRIs. Now, if you haven't had MRIs, we're going to stop and get some, then I'm going to see you again. But a lot of times in the modern era, people are coming to me with scans. And I'm a believer that you need to see your scans. I think it's important. I think getting a report, it's not real. And so we pull the scans up, even though I've already looked at them, and we go through them all. Now, that process can take anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour. And it's not something, in my opinion, to be rushed. It's only at that point in time that I can get a second cup of coffee and I can sit down and we can walk through the diagnostic criteria of MS as it relates to you. And so I tell them, in patient-friendly language, there's five things we have to think about. The first one is your story, all right? So we call that the medical history because it's fancy. It's what you tell me. And I have to listen to, are there elements of your story that are consistent with activity in MS or progression in MS? The second thing is we have to think about your examination that I did. And if you tell me, hey, I, I couldn't see out of my eye and it's better, I look for findings on your exam that buttress that. Now, not finding it doesn't mean you don't have MS, but that's what I'm looking for. The third thing that we look at are the MRIs. In 2016, MRIs have revolutionized how we diagnose MS. It allows us to do it much, much faster. And I talk about the characteristics on the MRI that are going to either make or not make aspects of diagnosis. That's going to be another topic. Sure. Yeah, save that for another we'll, we'll come back to it. Yeah. <laughs> the fourth thing is, if necessary, do we have a lumbar puncture? Right. Now, you know, if you go back in time, they were very necessary. Modern day, I don't get them on most patients. I get them on patients where the things aren't shaking out, where it's atypical. But I would say that 80% of people in our practice don't end up requiring that. The fifth thing, Stuart, is prove it's nothing else. 
Right. And so that's an onerous responsibility to make sure that I'm not thinking it's MS when it's something different. Right. Typically that involves a lot of laboratories. Right. Sometimes we do chest imaging and we have to rule out things that would mimic multiple sclerosis. If we go through that, it's then time to put it together. And I'll tell someone, we now know what's wrong. We now know that you have multiple sclerosis. Now, when I say that to someone, I, I pause. I say, is that something you're expecting? Is that news to you? And then I wait. Right. Because sometimes they can't hear anything else I say, and I have to be sensitive to that. And if they're shutting down, we're done. I don't kick them out of the clinic. I'm just going to meet them you know, next week. Right. It, it, everybody comes to accept what I said over time. Right. And I tell them, it's going to take a year or two before you start to feel okay and realize that you're going to thrive in life despite having this disease. It takes up to two years. And so I want to guide them during that process. We bring patients back within a week or two because they need a second visit. And I tell them, you don't have MS by yourself. You better bring your village. So if your wife didn't make it, you got to bring her next time. We have an onboarding process where that patient is then seen by physical and occupational therapy to see what's going on and what we can improve upon. And we have them meet with our social work team. And this is the key point. The social worker sits down and starts to talk about goals and starts to talk about life and starts to help them put all of this into context. Now that begins a process. It's not the end of the process, it's the beginning of the process. And we believe very firmly that you need to walk with someone over several visits before they start to understand. It is so important to me that a newly diagnosed patient understands why I'm asking them to do all this stuff. If you don't get it, you may do it, but you don't really understand, and it's less likely that you're gonna be continued, uh, involved, uh, engaged, adherent, all those things. Very, very important. I tell people, you don't have to have a neuroimmunology background to write things on the internet. And going to the internet, there's a risk. There's amazing information. I mean, you've got great information on the internet. But there are other sources that you might not know as a newly diagnosed patient. And so what I tell people is, early on, I may ask you not to read, not because I don't want to educate you, but because you don't have a filter yet. And if you choose to read, which most people do, bring me what you read and let's decode it. And so that's an important message as we start to learn about our MS. Okay, let's go in a different direction here. Sorry about that. No problem. We could go on forever.